Good afternoon, friends. My name is Brett Heinzman, and at one time I pastored the Jamestown Free Methodist Church, where I had the pleasure of knowing Frida. And so it's my honor, along with the current pastor, Pastor Dodie McIntyre, to help with our service today. I'd like to begin with a, a word of scripture from Proverbs 31, 25 through 26, that says, and I think this is so fitting, she is clothed with strength and dignity. And she laughs without fear of the future. When she speaks, her words are wise, and she gives instructions with kindness. That was free. Mm -hmm. uh, welcome. On behalf of Trudy, Marla, and Arnold, uh, welcome to this celebration of the life of Pastor Frida. We're so grateful for your presence. Let's start with a prayer together. Holy Spirit, come. <laughs> Enter this place, Lord God. As we spend time together, fellowshipping and in delightful remembrance of this woman that we loved, Lord, let our celebration not just honor her, but Father, she would be quite upset with us if it didn't honor you as well. <laughs> and so we are here, first and foremost, Lord, in the direction of this woman who has been such a kind and wonderful mentor to so many of us, to honor you, Lord, to lift your name as we celebrate her service to you. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. amen. Reverend Frida Mae Pitcher, 89, of Jamestown, New York, formerly of Lafayette, passed away Friday, September 24th, 2021, at UPMC Chautauqua. Born June 3rd, 1932, in Warren, she was a daughter of the late George and Josephine Moyer Craker. She was a graduate of Sugar Grove Central School. She earned her BA in education at Roberts Wesleyan College and her master's degree at St. Bonaventure University in administration. On December 24, 1955, in Sugar Grove, she married Reverend Richard E. Pitcher, who preceded her in death on September 21, 2009. Frida was a teacher in the Rochester City Schools District, Bolivar Central, and Jamestown City Schools. She loved to tend, look at, and spend time in her garden. But in her later years, her favorite pastime was spending time with her Lord. Daily, she could be found in her cozy covered porch, sitting in her favorite chair, reading scripture and conversing with God. She took very seriously her calling to spread the word of God, and she did it in special and unique ways. She was fond of arriving at someone's home with a basket of muffins and tea after she had heard they were, they were down or in crisis. In addition to pastoral ministry, the ministry of relationship, she practiced wherever she was stationed, until ministry was interrupted and limited by the pandemic, she led Bible studies in small groups at Joy Fellowship as well as within her home. Pastor Frida cared deeply about the formation of the church and its leaders and was active in mentoring, discipleship, and leadership until the day Jesus called her home. Surviving our two daughters, Trudy Oldham of Jamestown, New York, and Marla Jean Sink of Raleigh, North Carolina, one son, Arnold Newton Pitcher of Tulsa, Oklahoma, one daughter-in-law, Sadie Ann Pitcher of Bedford, Texas, eight grandchildren, Daniel Butts, Joshua Butts, David Butts, Joseph Pitcher, George Pitcher, Rachel Mullenhoff, Louis Roth, and Lauren Roth, seven great-grandchildren, Natalie Butts, Grady Butts, Marcus Butts, Anna Butts, Luca Mullenhoff, Samuel Mullenhoff, and Henry Pitcher, one sister, Mabel Miller, seven brothers, Ronald Craker, George Craker, Wesley Craker, Francis Craker, Jerry Craker, Kenneth Craker, Edward Craker, and many nieces and nephews. She was preceded in death by her parents, her husband Richard, one son, Clark Pitcher, one brother, Leslie Craker, and two sisters, Pauline Dollar and Marlene Lemming. 
I want to share a scripture with you, and then after that, I'm going to share some thoughts. But I'd also like to ask that the family be thinking, we'd love to give you an, a chance to share as well. So as I'm reading the scripture and then sharing a few thoughts, maybe you'd be thinking about a memory or something you'd like to share, and that time will be right after that. From Psalm 84, 5 through 7, we read, What joy for those whose strength comes from the Lord, who have set their minds on a pilgrimage to Jerusalem. When they walk through the valley of weeping, it will become a place of refreshing springs. The autumn rains will clothe it with blessings. They will continue to grow stronger, and each of them will appear before God in Jerusalem. Well, it was the first Sunday in July 2010, it was my very first Sunday as pastor of the Jamestown Free Methodist Church when I shook hands with a lovely lady named Frida. I soon learned that her husband Richard had pastored the church in the early 1980s and he had recently passed. She'd heard there was a new pastor appointed to the church and wanted to attend. Honestly, I think she came to check me out. <laughs> Frida stayed and once again made the Jamestown Church her home. I learned that Frida had a great sense of humor. Even now I can hear her laugh at one of her own jokes. <laughs> she would tell them at dinners we'd attend and then just roar along with us in laughter. Of course, every one of those jokes was accompanied by that little twinkle in her eye. You know what, I'm, what I am thinking of, don't you? Well, I introduced Frida to one of the finer things in life, and that's Tim Horton's coffee. Mm -hmm. Because of my influence, she came to love Tim Horton's decaf, and I consider that one of my greatest life's accomplishments. <laughs> but most importantly today, I want to share with you about Frida's love for God and her love for others. Frida was never one to grandstand her own spiritual depth, but anyone who was close to her knew there was something very, very special about her relationship with God the Father, his only son Jesus, and the Holy Spirit. It didn't take long for me to look forward to the times I visited with her, and I came to rely on her spiritual insight for ministry at the church and to feed my own soul. So I'd like to encourage us in these few moments today to embrace and embody some of the things that made Frida so special in her walk with Jesus. Because although Frida was very special, these things are not limited to just a few. They are limited to all who welcome them and embrace them. First, I would say, be generous. Frida would quietly notice a need and give generously toward it. She never made a big deal out of it. In fact, she insisted on the opposite. She knew that you simply could not outgive God, and she lived her life that way. Being generous is not out of our reach as well. We too cannot outgive God. I think Frida would like for us all to find a need and give toward it generously as we were able. Secondly, I think Frida would want us to love a good sun porch. Early mornings on her sun porch were times Frida cherished with God. She'd read her Bible and she'd pray. But more than that, often she would just listen for the voice of God. And she received words from him many, many times. That sun porch on Lovell Avenue in Jamestown, as far as I believe, is holy ground. It's a tent of meeting. If you don't know what that was, it was a place where Moses would visit with God. He would go into this tent and God would come down and they would converse as friends talk with one another. I think Frida would want us all to have a sun porch. That it, that's a tent of meeting where we would talk with Jesus and do it regularly because we too can have a rich and blessed prayer life with God. And I believe Frida would encourage us to find our prayer place and visit it often. Third, just do what God asks of you. In 2012, I led a study of the book, When Helping Hurts. It's a book about ministry to the poor and how to do it in ways that are truly helpful I led the study at St. Susan's Center in Jamestown, New York, the local soup kitchen there. Well over 50 people came to discuss that book and learn from it. At the end of the study, the, the ask, the question that I posed to those in the, in the group was this, who would be willing to come during meal times when the guests were being served and minister to them at St. Susan Center? Out of the 50 plus people who came there, one, just one. 
said yes. And that was Frida. She came to that soup kitchen week after week, day after day. She had a profound impact there. And why? Because when God asked her to do something, she only had one word on her mind and on her lips, and that was yes. She loved those people. She got to know them. She held Bible studies and prayer meetings in the soup kitchen and brought her new friends to church. I really believe Frida would encourage us to have our yes ready for the Lord. That whatever he may ask, we would say yes. And she'd encourage us to not just obey, but do it joyfully. Fourth, love people. You'll know this. Frida had a word she would say often when she was talking about people or something she saw God doing in their life. She'd go, oh, it's just so precious. She would use the word precious a lot. People are precious to her. Free to love people as unconditionally as I've seen in this life. You can only do that when the love of God is in you. I think of the scripture, 1 John 4, 7 through 8, which I memorized in the King James, so that's the only way I know to quote it. Mm -hmm. Beloved, let us love one another. For love is of God, and everyone that loveth is born of God and knoweth God. He that loveth not knoweth not God, for God. Is love. The fruit of the Spirit that is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self control. All of those things were in Frida. I saw those beautiful and godly attributes ingrained into her being because of the Holy Spirit at work in her life. And I think Frida would want us to embody God's love as we engage with other people in the very same way. Would you take a moment to pray with me? Lord God, we thank you for the example that Frida set for us. It's really your example. I praise you that you are a God who lives and that you desire these things for us even now, even today. Help us, Lord, in our own ways to find our prayer places with you, to obey you, to listen for your voice, to love people, and to be generous. These things we ask in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. And so now, family, if any of you have some words that you'd like to share, we invite you to, to come forward now and do that. Anyone who, who'd like to be first? Don't be shy. Certainly there's some stories or something you'd like to share, some thoughts. So my name is Marla, and I know most of you. And I was the youngest of four, so I got the kinder, gentler Frida picture. Um, what I would like to tell you is that there was a time when my parents were very legalistic, but then they were introduced to the Holy Spirit, and then the gentleness and the kindness and the love really flowed out of them. And so what I would like to say about my mom is that is what I experienced, just the sweetness and the kindness and the support that I did as a daughter, but I know many of you from church have seen that as well. So I, there are so many stories that we could tell, some, some good, some not so good, most of them great, <laughs> but uh, as any family. But if there's one thing that I'd love to say for my mom, is that she had so much love, and it was gentle and kind, and that is what I experienced. And it was a pleasure to be with her. Can I play that? Can I play that? So this is what my mom prophesied. My mom prophesied two, two months ago that there was going to be a death in the family. She, she had a vision and, and she said that. So of course, we're all wondering. Um, but she said it was okay. And then when she went into the hospital, this was um, Tuesday night, she had some chest pain. And then she was able, remarkably, to sit on the side of the bed. And she said to me, the Lord is coming to take me. 
And I cried in front of her and we had a wonderful conversation. And she said, everything's going to be okay. And then I said, Mom, is it going to be tonight? And she goes, I don't know. I go, Mom, if, would you ask the Lord? <laughs> because she had a better relationship. <laughs> I felt like she was right there. Would you ask the Lord, could it just wait so that I could be there as well? I wanted to see, see the release of the Spirit. I wanted to be there. And um, because with visiting, of course, they kick you out at seven. So she did. And so the next day I came in and um, brought her favorite purple blanket and gave her a sip of fresca. And she said, I'm fading from this earth. And so we called Arnie, we called True, called Pastor Doty. And while we, Pastor Doty was coming down, she talked to True, and she talked to Arnie, and told True, I'm excited, I'm excited, and then said goodbye. And so we, we transferred the care from, from all of the medications to, to comfort care. And she closed her eyes, and she said, Lord, Lord, precious Lord. I go, Mom, are you seeing Jesus? She goes, yes, I'm seeing Jesus. Because we thought she was going to leave right then, but she, the, whatever, it left her. And she was just joyous. And then for the last time, she opened her eyes. And I don't think she opened her eyes to see this birth. She opened her eyes, and she smiled. And then she was gone. It took a day and a half for her body to catch up with whatever flight she was on. But she was in heaven. And I know she asked Pastor Doty, Pastor Doty, I, I know you thought that I left the room. But I just I went around the corner, so I was eavesdropping. And Pastor Doty asked, what, what prayers did she have? And she asked that the release would come quickly. And then she asked for things for her kids. So I know, I know things, things were wonderful where she is, and she had that beautiful, beautiful smile. And she saw something. I think she saw Jesus, and then she saw my dad. <laughs> and, and then the last thing was this. Five, she died at 103 on the morning, um, Thursday morning. I was lying beside her, and Pastor Doty said, you cannot just stay here and just listen to your mom breathe. But, but that night, I went to sleep at 8 o'clock. It was the first time that I could sleep. 12.58, I woke up. There was warmth in the room, and I went and put on my contacts. And then I went over to Mom, and the nurses came in, and she took her last breath. And I was there to be there with her when the transfer took place. The Lord was good to her and good to me all the way to the end. So my encouragement for all of us is this, and again, myself included. Let's learn to grow closer to the Lord so we can hear what she was able to hear. And ask the Lord was so close that she, right to the end, he answered her prayer, answered my prayer. So I have one just wonderful memory to walk that I'd like to pass along to you, that she was, a, I know that when she saw Jesus, it was, well done, my good and faithful servant. And that's, I know our hope for our family too, that we receive that blessing. So. Are there others that would like to share? You may do it right from where you are if you are more comfortable with that. Lord, and um, I just echo what 
like water to spare, and I'm speaking and I can remember her because she's been more protected. And um, she was a special lady. Um, and it's just it's wonderful to be here and to spend a lot of time with mom and and to bring her reunited together too. Mm -hmm. So um, I'm just thankful that I in my life have the opportunity to know her. Well, I feel like I want to hang a help wanted sign outside my office. <laughs> His shoe is certainly my go-to in the time that I've been in Jamestown. There wasn't a single prophetic dream that I had that I didn't go to her first about. There wasn't a single decision that I knew was going to be difficult for the church that I didn't go to her first about. There wasn't a single time when I was in crisis myself and struggling that I didn't go to her first. Even before my own family. Because we could trust that her response was pure. Directly from God. Did not pass through her own needs and wants, but came directly from God to us. So the New Testament scripture for today um, may seem a little out of place, but bear with me for a moment. It's in John 11, verses 25 through 27. Jesus told her, I am the resurrection and the life. Anyone who believes in me will live even after dying. Everyone who lives in me and believes in me will never, ever die. Do you believe this, Martha? Yes, Lord, she told him. I always believed you are the Messiah, the Son of God, the one who has come into the world from God. That response to Jesus is so true to Frida's heart. So true. You know, this is the same Martha who busied herself in the kitchen while Mary sat at Jesus' feet. If you don't know that story, come and see me after. I'd love to share it with you. But Martha was the busy one. Uh, she wanted to be the perfect host. And she was angry at her sister Mary for sitting with Jesus instead of helping her. I see these two. <laughs> instead of helping her in the kitchen. And you know, at this place in Frida's Bible, which I am holding at this moment, she wrote in the, the caption of John, where Martha ran from the house to meet Jesus. She didn't even wait till he came to the doorstep. She heard he was coming and she ran. And Frida Pitcher wrote, she learned her lesson. <laughs> Isn't that beautiful? She did indeed learn her lesson. Martha comes out to Jesus, her Savior, because it was the better thing at the moment. She was deep in grief. Some of you understand that feeling today. In her deep grief, she goes to the one person that she knows will give her comfort. 
heart in peace. And that's Jesus, her Savior. And she cried out to him in her sorrow, thinking that he had come to extend sympathies. Lord, if only you had been here when Lazarus was sick, you would be, he would be alive today. Some paint this as a condemning statement for Jesus. I don't think so. I think this is a statement of faith by Martha. Lord, I know that if you were here, he would still be with us today. She didn't know what Jesus had planned. You know, obituary is but a glimpse, kind of a movie trailer produced from impactful moments within a person's life. Though it's helpful uh, in maybe learning a few things that you didn't know and connect some familial dots, in no way does it produce the impact of the entire movie. Boy, did the entirety of Frida's life have deep impact. And there are a few, both lifers and newbies at our church, that were impacted deeply by this woman, by our beloved Frida. Her quiet but confident voice still fills the ears of those who knew her well. She didn't always speak, but when she did, we all listened. Why did we listen? It was because of her faith. Frida Pitcher's faith was a tangible thing that could not be hidden if she tried. She lived and breathed Jesus. He was her sustainer, her counselor, her father, and her friend. I had the great privilege of holding this sacred treasure, this Bible, for a couple of days as I used it to gain even more insight into the faith of this precious woman. And there were both some affirmations and some new things that I wanted to share with you. The first was that she was constantly evaluating herself, not others. Against scripture and assessing who she was, always striving to be the best version of her. From very early on, this Bible is filled with her pleas to the Lord to reveal what was broken inside of her. And on August 11th, 1977, which happens to be my mom's birthday, so it really popped out at me. Well, the August 11th part, not the 77. She wrote these words. Oh God, grant me a complete and unrestrained revelation of my own self. And in July 22nd of 1983, she said, Holy Spirit, reveal the truth to me. She was constantly in self-reflection because she wanted to be the absolute best representation of her Savior that she could possibly be. I also learned that she knew that she could do nothing for the cause of Christ under her own power. She knew her human limitations and God's great strength. And in Hebrews 11, in the Hall of Faith, she wrote this note. And it was a reflection of verse 34. One of the practical results of faith is that it makes weak men strong. In faith, weakness is turned to strength, and she leaned hard on that strength. And I know in the past few years, she and I had many conversations about how she felt the strength was leaving her, but it was a great celebration because she had nothing left but to lean on Jesus. Though many of us revered her as the perfect example of faith, she knew she was not. In Luke 22, verses 31 through 32, she had rewritten this passage, and I want you to hear it. Simon, in parentheses, Frida, 
Simon, Frida, Satan has asked to sift each of you like wheat, but I have pleaded in prayer for you, Simon, Frida, that your faith should not fail. So when you have repented and turned to me again, strengthen your brothers. Which leads also to my final reflection. She knew she was called to greatness. Not because she had ego or felt self-important. She knew that her great calling was to impact the world for Christ. To make it known to each of you, which was most important to her, that God is real. That Christ died to free you from the grip of sin and that he rose from the grave to show you that you can and will do the same if you would only accept him as your Lord and Savior. If Frida were here today, she would prove the truth of this statement with an eloquent walk through scripture and her personal testimony, and you would be blessed. But in her passing, she's given you something sweeter. I was going to share the moment that Marla shared with you at this moment in time. I want you to understand that Frida's eyes had been closed. She had received her first dose of morphine and she, her body was at rest. And she, when she cried out, Lord, Lord, we jumped up because we thought she was in pain and we wanted to help her if there was something that we could do. And the look on her face as she said, oh, sweet Jesus, it's beautiful. is something I will never forget for the rest of my life. If you ever had a doubt or wonder whether heaven was real, that message is for you. It's real. She's there. And she wants you to know how sweet it is. Frida had a very deep and personal relationship with Jesus. But her friendship was not exclusive. You have the same opportunity to have what she had. Are you convinced yet? Do you know him personally yet? Frida would tell me that I cannot close this message without giving you the opportunity to do it. So from her Bible, in her words, on the fourth page of this precious book, she had written how to receive Christ. And she says these words, today you can begin a relationship with Jesus Christ by praying this prayer. Let's pray together. Oh God, I am a sinner. I am sorry for my sin. I'm willing to turn from my sin. I receive Jesus as my Savior. I confess him as my Lord from now on. I want to follow him in the fellowship of his church. In Jesus' name, amen. No more precious words can you utter in the history of your life. Make it be part of your final trade. Amen. At the conclusion of our service in just a moment today, we will be going, for those of you that will be joining us for a committal ceremony at the, at the cemetery in Lafayette, but for those of you who will not be joining us there, I want to share a passage of scripture with you in just a few words in lieu of the committal ceremony for you. Paul wrote to the church in Colossae in chapter 3, verses 1 through 4, these words. Interesting that he wrote it to the living about the reality of what our lives are when we say yes to Jesus. He said, since then you have been raised with Christ, set your hearts on things above where Christ is, seated at the right hand of God. Set your minds on things above, not on earthly things. 
And then listen to what he says here. For you died, and your life is now hidden with Christ in God. When Christ, who is your life, appears, then you also will appear with him in glory. Friends, for those of us who are in Jesus, we have died to this world and have embraced a new reality. And our life, your life, is now hidden with Christ in God. Frida's life was and is still hidden with Christ in God. And when he who is our life appears, then we also will appear with him in glory. I pray that that, that word of hope lingers with you. Lingers with you. Let's pray. Thank you, Jesus, that our lives can be hidden with you. And Lord, we thank you that the reality is true, that you one day will come in the clouds and you will call your bride to yourself. How we long for that day. But until then, Lord, we thank you for the gift of Frida's life, for her example, for these words that, that come off the pages of her, her very private Bible and speak to us publicly today. We pray that this living hope would settle deep into our hearts and would live within us until we too are with you in glory and would go with us from this place this day. Though our hearts may mourn and our emotions may be stirred because we miss our dear sister so desperately, may we also have this inner peace that passes all understanding, knowing that you, Lord, are our living hope. We pray these things in the powerful and almighty name of Jesus Christ. Amen. This concludes our services here this afternoon. As the minister alluded to, we'll be going on to the cemetery. It had been pushed to go, and the cemetery is located directly behind the little church up there on the hill. Um, those of you that wish to go with us, as you're excused from the building, if you would go to your cars and turn your bright lights and remain in place. Once the family's been excused and they start out to their cars, we'll give you some instructions as to who to follow. Okay? So to give the family a few moments here privately before we leave for the cemetery, maybe starting from the back of the funeral home, if you wish to come up and pay your respects, you may do so at this time, and then I encourage you to go to your cars. And Once it's just the family here, we'll give them a few minutes, and then we'll uh, all start for the cemetery. Okay.